The Falkland Islands, also known as Islas Malvinas, are an archipelago in the South Atlantic, whose sovereignty is disputed by Argentina and the United Kingdom. Since 1833, it is the UK that occupies the territory. On April 2, 1982, Argentina invaded the islands, starting the Falklands War, which ended with the British victory on June 14. This unlikely war caused the death of 907 people, proving that territorial disputes continue to be very relevant today. For many centuries, until the end of World War II, territorialist ambitions were the main cause of war. Despite the predominance of interstate conflicts in current international politics, interstate conflicts still threaten international peace. Notable examples are the decades-long Israel-Palestine conflict, India-Pakistan dispute for Kashmir, and the quarrel involving China, the Philippines, Vietnam, and other countries for the control of islets in the South China Sea. In 2014, when the well-drowned and peaceful Europe was worried about economics and migration, Crimean Peninsula was annexed by Russia. In 2022, Ukraine has been invaded. International controversies must be solved through the respect for the treaties, customs, jurisprudence and doctrine developed by international law. So, which country has greater legitimacy to possess the Falkland Islands? Let's start with the history of the conflict. Possible discoveries were made in the 16th century by Spanish and British navigators, but the first and controverted discovery was made in 1600 by the Dutchman Sebald de Viet. Thus, for some time the islands became known as the Sebaldine Islands. In 1690, the first landing was made by John Strong, and in the early 18th century, the islands were visited by whale hunters from the French city of Saint-Malo, reason why they became known as Ile Malouine, from which derived the Spanish word Malvinas. However, as pointed out by Gilbert Guillaume, a former judge of the International Court of Justice, these early discoveries and landings were not followed for a long time by any effective occupation and consequently did not give anyone any sovereignty rights. The first act of possession was made by France in 1764 with the foundation of Port Louis on East Falkland. Unaware of the French presence in the archipelago, the British also took possession of the islands in 1765, erecting the settlement of Port Egmont on Saunders Island, part of the island surrounding West Falkland. It is important to consider that both settlements were considerably distant from each other, nestled in a very indented coastline, and by the principle of effective occupation, or uci possidetis, the reach of sovereignty of each state was restricted to the respective harbors and adjacencies. Spain opposed the situation, claiming that through the Treaty of Tordesillas, the archipelago already belonged to it even before the French and British expeditions. Due to the family pact signed in 1761 by the Spanish and French crowns, both of the House of Bourbon, France preferred to cede its possession without further protests. Thus, in 1767, Spain took possession of Port Louis, which was renamed Puerto Soledad. In 1770, an expedition ordered by Bucarelli y Ursua, the governor of Buenos Aires, expelled the British from Port Egmont. When the news arrived in Europe, Great Britain protested and prepared for war. The next year, an agreement between Spain and Great Britain restored the possession of Port Egmont to the British. The Argentine assumption that this agreement would have been secretly conditioned on the abandonment of the British sovereignty claims has never been proven and therefore it cannot be considered in the juridical analysis. The principle of effective occupation, enshrined in the treaties of Madrid and Paris, has legitimized both British and Spanish occupations. Each state acquires rights of sovereignty over the territories it effectively occupies, independently of the chronological issue. The agreements of 1771 between Spain and the United Kingdom respected this principle, involuntarily or not, establishing two zones of influence, Spanish to the east and British to the west, separated by the Falkland Sound or Canal de San Carlos. In 1774, the British departed from Port Egmont, leaving a flag and a plague, claiming the rights over the said 
Falklands Island. The Spanish removed the plague in 1775 and destroyed Port Egmont in 1780, but they never occupied Saunders Island or West Falkland. In 1811, the Spanish departed from Puerto Soledad, also leaving a plague stating that, quote, this island of Soledad de Malvinas and what it contains belongs to the sovereignty of Mr. Don Fernando VII, King of Spain and the Indies, unquote. Considering the intention, or animus, in the continuity of both possessions, there was no abandonment in either case. According to Faro Jr., for abandonment or the relictio, not only evacuation is necessary, but also the renunciation of sovereignty over the territory. Temporary non-occupation is not enough if one can presume the intention not to abandon. In 1816, the United Provinces of the River Plate, the precursor state of Argentina, declared independence from Spain. Defending the thesis of Uchi Posidetis Iuris, Argentina claimed to inherit the Spanish domains over the archipelago, since they were administered in colonial times by the vice-royalty of the Rio de la Plata, with capital in Buenos Aires. Contrary to the British argument, Uchi Posidetis Iuris is a principle of international law universally accepted after its use in the African independencies, as well as by the International Court of Justice in the border dispute of former Yugoslavia in 1986. Therefore, it can be partially applied in favor of Argentina. Given the principle of effective occupation and the non-occurrence of the relictio in the British possession of Port Egmont, Argentina could only inherit Puerto Soledad and adjacencies, and not the whole archipelago. In 1820, David Jewett, an American privateer, took possession of the islands, alleging a commissioning from the Argentine state. This commissioning has never been proven. In 1823, the Argentine government gave permission to Jorge Pacheco and Luis Verne to usufruct the, quote, island of Soledad, one of the Malvinas, unquote. In 1826, Verne founded Puerto Luis, on the same site of former Puerto Soledad. In 1829, the Argentine government made the colonization official by nominating Verne as political and military commander of the Malvinas. In the same year, the United Kingdom protested against this decree because it affected the British rights over the archipelago. In 1833, taking advantage of the chaotic situation that followed an American attack on Puerto Luis a year before, the United Kingdom took possession of the Falklands, arguing that the islands were res nullius, that is, no man's land. The residents were persuaded to stay, mainly because most of them were Germans and English. This act of force was a violation of international law, even under the legal understanding of that time. Already in the 18th century, Emer de Vatel thought that the force of arms did not operate a definitive acquisition of sovereignty. And by the time of the Congress of Vienna, the occupation of a territory during war came to be considered a simple de facto situation. On June 17, 1833, the Argentine Chancellor Don Manuel Moreno protested against the British taking of the, quote, Malvinas, that is to say, the island of Soledad, or Puerto Luis, separated from Port Egmont by a sea channel, unquote. In other words, the sea channel called Falkland Sound, indicating that the United Kingdom was disrespecting the principle of Uchi Posidetis by conquering East Falkland. From 1833 to 1849, Argentina protested every year against the British possession of the Falkland Islands. In 1850, Britain and Argentina ratified the convention between Great Britain and the Argentine Confederation for the settlement of existing differences and the re-establishment of friendship. Considering the nature of this convention, the United Kingdom claims that it excluded the continuation of any territorial dispute. As determined by the doctrine, in peace treaties, the territories not mentioned must be confirmed under possession of the state which occupies them at the moment. Differently from 1850, in 1825, when both countries signed the Treaty of Friendship, Trade and Navigation, the first attempt by Pacheco and Vernet had already failed, and in any case, it did not affect the British rights, 
as it was a private colony whose activities were restricted to East Falkland. After the convention's ratification, there were no further protests for the next 38 years. In a speech to the Argentine Congress in 1866, Vice President Marcos Paz said that the British government, quote, accepted as arbitrator the President of the Republic of Chile on damages suffered by English subjects in 1845. This question has not yet been resolved, which is the only one that subsists with that nation, unquote. In the 1870s and 1880s, the Argentine government published several maps that did not show the archipelago as an Argentine territory. The most famous of these, known as Latina map of 1882, clearly highlights Argentina in shades of orange, while the Islas Malvinas were painted in beige, the same color used to represent Chile and Uruguay, that is, non-Argentine territories. After an isolated protest in 1888, Argentina ceased to protest for more 58 years. Between 1899 and 1902, Argentina accepted the United Kingdom as arbitrator in a territorial dispute against Chile, which would be incompatible with the maintenance of a territorial dispute between both countries. Arises the question if this effective, continuous, peaceful and prolonged possession has configured the acquisitive prescription, or usucapio, in favor of the United Kingdom. International law has not yet set any term for the prescription. What is required is that the term must be sufficient, according to Odine, to imply the tacit consent of the state dispossessed of a part of its territory. According to Faro Jr., many authors opine for a period of 50 years. Epitácio Pessoa requires 40 years. Fauchil is satisfied with the period of 30 years accepted by private law. Even if the usurpation occurs through the use of force, the prescription can happen if the possession becomes consented. This consent does not need to be verbal, but manifested in ways it can be understood. Considering the clear change in Argentina's attitude towards the British occupation from 1850 onwards, not only due to the absence of protests, but also due to demonstrations that the country did not have any territorial dispute with the United Kingdom, the prolonged possession of the Falklands has become consented, and thus the prescription happened in favor of the United Kingdom. In the second half of the 19th century, for the first time, several parts of the archipelago were occupied, with the settlements of Stanley, Darwin, Goose Green and North Arm on East Falkland, and Port Howard and Hill Cove on West Falkland. In 1946, Argentina returned to the question at the United Nations. The Argentine jurist José María Ruda, posteriorly judge at the International Court of Justice, presented a famous defense of the Argentine claims, alleging that the British administration over the islands was colonialist and that the local population was temporary, so that it could not constitute a people with right to self-determination. It must be highlighted that, contrary to what Argentina believes, at this point it could not allege any right of sovereignty over the Falkland Islands, after all circumstances that determined the Argentine consent regarding the British occupation of the archipelago and its consequent acquisitive prescription in favor of the United Kingdom. Therefore, the Argentine defense of the island's decolonization could only mean an attitude of solidarity towards the islanders and not a way to retrieve its old territory. First of all, the population is not temporary. Families such as the Bigs have been presenting the archipelago since 1842. The census carried out on the islands in 2012 revealed that, except for the residents at Mount Pleasant Air Base, 53.5% of the population was born in the archipelago, which demonstrates that the United Kingdom does not carry out a kind of rotation of inhabitants to guarantee its right to occupy the islands. According to the same census, when asked about their national identity, 57% of the inhabitants considered themselves Falkland Islanders, and only 24.6% considered themselves British. Claiming that the inhabitants of the Falkland Islands would not be a people seems to flirt with racism, something that Resolution 1514, paragraph 5, explicitly condemns. Furthermore, the same paragraph speaks of, quote, peoples of those territories, unquote, 
in reference to trust and non-self-governing territories or all other territories which have not yet attained independence. Consequently, all the populations of these territories are considered as peoples by the United Nations and no other interpretation is possible. Since the UK voluntarily recognized the Falkland Islands as a non-self-governing territory, there is no doubt that the Falkland Islanders constitute a people. Argentina also claims that the United Nations Resolution 2065 of 1965 provides that the solution for the Falklands dispute must take into account the interests and not the will of the Islanders, being such interests merely the promotion of well-being and human rights, excluding political aspirations. This interpretation is in complete disagreement with the provisions of the entire legal framework of the United Nations, especially its Charter and Resolutions 1514, 1541 and 2065 itself, which explicitly cites the previous ones. Moreover, it's a clear attempt to subvert the obvious meaning given to the text, inserted in the scope of decolonization. According to the Charter of the United Nations, Chapter 1, Article 1, Paragraph 2, one of the main purposes of the UN is to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. Resolution 1514, on which the Argentine argument is largely based, establishes that all peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. Paragraph 5 of the same resolution further states that immediate steps must be taken to transfer all powers to the peoples of territories that have not yet attained independence, quote, without any conditions or reservations, in accordance with their freely expressed will and desire, without any distinction as to race, creed or color, in order to enable them to enjoy complete independence and freedom, unquote. In this sense, the Falklands Constitution of 2009 provides enhanced local democracy and internal self-government and enshrines the right of self-determination. By the UN Resolution 1541, according to the will of the local populations, non-autonomous territories can evolve towards autonomy through a. independence, b. free association with an independent state, or c. integration with an independent state. In a 2013 referendum, the Falkland Islanders decided to continue to be a dependent territory of the United Kingdom by 99.8% of the votes. Above all, the Falkland Islands should never have been included on the list of territories to be decolonized, for the simple fact that there was never a native population on the islands and consequently what the UN defines as colonialism. Quote, the subjection of peoples to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation. Unquote. Although it is a rare phenomenon, there are some islands and archipelagos which did not have a native population at the time of the arrival of the European settlers. It can be mentioned the Falkland Islands, Ascension Island, St. Helena and Tristan da Cunha, all belonging to the United Kingdom, as well as the Açores Islands that belong to Portugal. The absence of a native population is understandable in all cases, as they are located hundreds of kilometers from the nearest coast. Tristan da Cunha, in particular, is nothing more than an emerged volcano, 2,400 kilometers from the nearest land, with a small village called Edinburgh of the Seven Seas, home to 251 inhabitants. The Açores were uninhabited until 1431, when they began to be colonized by Portugal. Understandably, the Açores would have never been labeled with a colonial status. Likewise, there was never any call for the decolonization of Svalbard from Norway or the Kerguelen Islands from France. On the other hand, no one has ever claimed a colonial status for Chilean Easter Island, Russian Siberia, Canadian Nunavut or Argentine Patagonia, despite the consistent presence of a native population in these places. It's clear how the member states of the United Nations were not careful to be concerned with certain specificities brought by immigration processes, even though they have expressed their desire to end colonialism, quote, in all its forms and manifestations, unquote. When talking about the territorial inviolability of a given state, this means that the UN rejects changes in the national borders of its members, generally motivated by secessionist movements, 
Therein lies perhaps the greatest irony of the Falkland Islands case. If the archipelago were an integral and inalienable part of the United Kingdom, like Scotland or the Kent County, for example, paragraph 6 would condemn an uprising in the islands, as these would undermine the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom. Therefore, it is precisely because the Falkland Islands have always been on the list of territories to be decolonized that they have the most perfect right to self-determination. Additionally, Argentina does two other claims, geographical proximity and geological continuity. Both are non-academic but widespread arguments. The idea of sovereignty rights based on proximity or contiguity does not have foundation in international law, since it is totally contrary to Uchi Possidetis, the disqualification of contiguity as a legal basis for the acquisition of sovereign rights was enunciated in 1928 through Max Huber's famous arbitration in the case of the territorial dispute over the island of Palmas, considered an important precedent for disputes involving islands. Huber argued that there was no rule of positive international law for the claim based on proximity, and that if the international community took such an inappropriate approach, it would lead to arbitrary results. Indeed, that would be the same as forcing Spain to hand over the Canary Islands to Morocco, or Denmark handing over the Ferry Islands to the United Kingdom, the UK handing over Guernsey and Jersey to France, the United States handing over the island of St. Lawrence to Russia, the Netherlands handing over Bonaire to Venezuela, or the United Kingdom handing over Gulf Island to South Africa, which is a very interesting case. On this island belonging to the United Kingdom, considered the most remote inhabited territory in the world, all that exists is a South African weather station maintained since 1956 by a team from the South African National Antarctic Program. This fact does not cause any disturbance to the British sovereignty over the island, which is part of the British overseas territory of St. Helena, Ascension and Tristan da Cunha. Another fact that nullifies the argument of geographical proximity between Argentina and the Falkland Islands is highlighted by Pasco and Pepper. The coast opposite the Falklands was not held by Argentina until Britain had administered the Falklands for almost half a century. In 1833, Argentina had not even occupied all of what is now the province of Buenos Aires, so any argument that the proximity of the Falklands to the Argentine coast supports Argentina's sovereignty claim is weak historically as well as irrelevant in international law. Indeed, Patagonia was only effectively incorporated into the Argentine territory during the so-called Conquista del Desierto between 1878 and 1885. Historically, the Spanish crown was not successful in conquering the Patagonian territory because of its inhospitable nature and the strong presence of the Mapuche Tehuelches, an indigenous people whose border reached the Salado Bonaerense River, very close to Buenos Aires. The only settlements in Patagonia were Carmen de Patagones, San José de la Candelaria, Puerto Deseado and Florida Blanca. By the royal order of August 1, 1783, it was decided to evacuate them, with the exception of Carmen de Patagones. So, without being physically present south of Carmen de Patagones, on the Atlantic coast, and south of San Carlos, on the Pacific coast, Spain needed the other countries to recognize its sovereignty over the Southern territories. Otherwise, they could be considered res nullius according to the principle of effective occupation. In 1790, Spain took advantage of the Nootka Sound Convention with Great Britain to guarantee it, stating that the parties should not form in the future any establishment on the parts of the coast situated to the south of the parts of the same coast and of the islands adjacent already occupied by Spain. The most obvious interpretation for the meaning of such adjacent islands is the simplifying purpose of encompassing the thousands of islands of the intricate outline of southern Chile, really adjacent to the mainland and virtually impossible to be nominated one by one in the convention, and not the obscure purpose of referring indirectly to the Falklands, more than 400 kilometers from the coast of South America. The thesis of geological continuity, stated by Alfredo Bologna in 1982, defends that the Falklands, as well as the South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, must belong to Argentina due to the fact that they, quote, emerge from its continental shelf 
thus belonging to the geological unity of Argentina." Unquote. This claim represents a mistake in the interpretation of the law of the sea. Under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, adopted in 1982, only the territorial sea is considered to be under the sovereignty of the state, and it extends up to 12 nautical miles from the coast. Over the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf, the state only has rights of economic exploration, scientific research, and environmental protection. Therefore, the law of the sea does not determine territorial sovereignties, but rather the limits spaces destined for the exclusive exploitation of resources. This becomes clear when analyzing the judgment of the International Court of Justice in relation to the territorial and marine dispute Nicaragua versus Colombia. As the title itself indicates, territorial dispute and maritime dispute are different things. In this case, the court first decided on the sovereignty of the San Andres archipelago, the territorial issue, and only then determined the maritime boundaries between Colombia and Nicaragua, that is, the maritime issue. According to the court's own decision, only lands that remain above water during high tide are capable of appropriation. Therefore, it is the mainland that generates maritime domains, and never the opposite. If such reasoning were followed, France or Norway could claim the island of Great Britain because it emerges from the same continental shelf, which is evidently absurd. As for the oil exploration currently underway in the Falklands, it would be foolhardy if the United Kingdom were to start drillings on the continental shelf beyond the EEZ before the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf concludes the definition of the respective limits. As this does not happen, there is no offense to international law. Now, a final consideration. Even if the acquisitive prescription had not occurred in favor of the United Kingdom, an ex equo et bono decision, foreseen in the Statute of the International Court of Justice, could hardly ignore the fact that after more than 180 years of effective and continuous occupation, the islanders ended up establishing deep roots in the land and forming their own identity. Thus, any drastic change in the political, economic, social, and above all, cultural organization of the islands would enormously affect the well-being of the local population. Therefore, the status quo must be preserved, both for what is right and for what is fair. Answering the central question, it is the United Kingdom that has greater legitimacy to occupy and exercise sovereignty rights over the Falkland Islands. However, the United Kingdom must be always attentive to the will of the islanders, caring for the right to self-determination. The people of the Falkland Islands has unique characteristics, resulting from an extremely peculiar history, and this way, any legal analysis about their case must be careful and free from preconceptions. As exalted so symbolically by the Falklands' own motto, desire the right.